Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Health Leader Forge, a podcast from the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. My name is Mark Bonica, and I will be your host for this episode. Today's guest is John Polanowitz, the Executive Vice President of Steward Healthcare's Hospital Services Group. Steward Healthcare is a large for-profit hospital system with a national presence. In this podcast, we talk about John's fascinating career beginning with his time at the United States Military Academy at West Point, his tour as an Army Aviation Unit Commander and Black Hawk pilot, and then on to his experiences as a hospital CEO and his service as the Secretary of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services for the state of Massachusetts, and finally his role today at Steward. We close on a discussion of leadership and John's advice to early careerists. I want to thank the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives for their ongoing sponsorship of the podcast. Thanks for listening, and here is John Polanowitz. Welcome to The Forge, John. Thank you for having me. You went to the United States Military Academy at West Point, where you majored in engineering. Why did you go to West Point, and how did you choose engineering? So uh, the, the, the second part of that is the easiest. At the time, the only degree that West Point gave was a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. So okay. it was a, a, an N of one in terms of the degree choice. But I had been um, interested in going to an engineering school in any event and had an opportunity to go to West Point, I was already thinking about doing an ROTC scholarship and the, the combination of you know, a great engineering school with a, with a liberal arts basis and going to, uh, to West Point you know, made the choice pretty easy. And within engineering, what was your sub, subfield? So actually, I spent most of my time around computer science, okay. you know, computer science and, and math at the time. So it, it, everyone is required to do a core, you know, a series of core courses around basic engineering, mechanical engineering, physics, electrical engineering. And after I did those, I had, had some affinity on the computer science side, so stayed with that. Interesting. So what, when did you know you wanted to serve in the military? Because, I mean, going to, going to West Point implies a, a tour uh, afterwards. So when did you know, you know, this is something I want to do? So, I, you know, I think as I started looking at going to colleges, you know, and, and grew up in upstate New York, oldest of four, uh, was going to be the first one, you know, in the family on either side to have gone to college. To be perfectly honest, I look at the military service initially as a way to get to college. It was a way to help pay the bills to uh, to go to uh, go to a college, and then I had a West Point cadet had come to talk to our school about the academy, and I had known his brother. I had actually played sports against his brother for a long time, so I had known him as he was older, and he talked to me about the uh, about West Point, and I didn't really know that much about it. I went down and visited, and I will tell you, by the time I finished the visit and I came back, I'm like, okay, this is this is where I want to go. This is yeah. what I want to do. What was it about it that that sold you? You know, I thought it was uh, so. First off, the the you know the the place in and of itself is impressive. You know, it's it's an amazing place. At the time that I spent there, you know, both in terms of the classes and then we were doing some athletic things while we were there, it just felt comfortable. It was par you know smart driven people mm -hmm. who, you know, by and large didn't take themselves too seriously, which was, which was good. You know, there was a lot of focus on athletics and I think, you know, it was just, you know, they do a great job at it. So when you come back, it's like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is exactly where I want to go. Okay. So, so you were commissioned in 1984. What branch did you go into? Uh, I chose aviation. Okay. I went to, uh, went to armor basic because this is before the aviation had their own basic course, uh, and then from there, you know, airborne school, ranger school, air assault, and then finally, uh, finally got down to Fort Rucker to uh, learn to fly helicopters. And what did you fly? I flew Blackhawks. Okay. I flew Blackhawks. So. so you served in the Army for about six years with your final position as a company commander for a Blackhawk assault helicopter company. What was that? What was the mission of that organization? Tell us a little bit about what you were doing. So I was in the 7th Infantry Division Light, which is now deactivated. It was uh, the Army was testing the new light infantry concept. So it was infantry units and field artillery, all that had very few vehicles. So we had two Black Hawk companies supporting a 10,000 man infantry division. So we were the guys that 
you know, flew the infantry in. We hauled field artillery pieces around. We moved the field artillery. We ha- we did resupply runs. Basically, any time the um, the units were in the field, we were in the field to support them. Wow. So, it, which was great. It was a really good unit. Tons of flight hours and really interesting missions. Roughly, how many men were under your, your command? I had I had about 120 men and women under my command. The um, we had uh, we had female aviators and female crew chiefs, you know, in addition to you know platoon sergeants and first sergeants and everything else. So, okay. wow! And how many Blackhawks were in that? So the um, in the company there's 15 Blackhawks. Wow. So three platoons of, of five five apiece. What lessons do you recall from your time in the army? What did you learn about leadership and and so forth? Yeah, I, I think the I think the main thing, and this really started, you know, they they tried to um, to grill this into you at West Point, but they're a, a big part of being, I, I think, an effective leader, whether it's in the military or otherwise, is, you know, this concept of selfless sacrifice, putting putting the men and women that work for you first, being holding them accountable, but providing them the tools and the supports that they need to, uh, to, do, their, to do their job. And you know, and candidly, a lot of the things that I've learned from when I was a platoon leader to when I was an executive officer and then a company commander, you still use today. Even it's kind of funny. People are often like, oh, well, it must be so hard doing this, given that in the military, it's all, you know, you do what people do, what you say. Uh, we're in an all volunteer army. So it's, it's not, it's not the fifties pictures of the, the drill sergeant barking out commands and everybody hupping too. So a lot of what I learned there and a lot of what most of the individuals coming out of the service academies suits them very well in today's business environment. So you served in the, uh, in the army for six years. You were a West Point grad and a pilot, and it sounded like you had some exciting things. Mm-hmm. What made you decide, you know, that's that's enough time? And yeah, and- so after I had, um, uh, so I finished up my company command after I had done some combat time in Panama during the Noriega invasion, and after I gave up my company, because of the mission that we had, we I spent in the last two years that I was in about you know forty or fifty days at home. I was deployed to Panama, to Uruguay, to Paraguay. I was in Korea. I was in the National Training Center, the Joint Readiness Training Center, just not around much. And at the time, I had uh, had the conversation with our branch officials to say, I will go any place in the world as long as it's an accompanied tour so that my wife could come with me, uh, who she had a JAG commission because she had gone to law school while I was basically deployed for that whole time. And the response back was, that's great. You need to go to Korea on an unaccompanied <laughs> tour for 18 months. And right. I'm like, uh, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to do that. And uh, they talked about, you know, potentially if I didn't want to do that, I could go back to school and, and teach at West Point. And I was candidly at that point, I was just kind of burnt. I'm like, really? Uh, done this and this and this. Send me any place in the world just as long as my wife can come. Now today, with the multiple deployments, it's there's many of these stories today. Back then, you know, not in right in what has been the longest conflict that the United States has been in, it was you know the amount of time that I spent away was almost unheard of, and I thought it was a relatively minor ask. Given you've got the whole globe to send me to, just send me someplace where you know my wife can come, who I haven't seen much for the last two years, so. So at that point, I decided to get out. Okay. So you, you left the Army and you went to work for Stryker, which mm-hmm. is a medical technology company. What was your role and what was it like making the jump from flying helicopters and being in the Army to working in a medical technology company? So coming out of the, coming out of the military, there's, a, uh, there's an entire industry set up around identifying and hiring junior military officers that are coming out of the military. And at the time it was you know there's two kind of major tracks that you went you could go and be you know there was a lot of interest in having the junior military officers be sales reps so pharmaceutical sales reps or medical device sales reps or or go into an operations role and uh, so i can remember i was in san francisco at a junior military officer recruiting thing and the i had an opportunity to meet the team at striker 
the the individual that I would be working for was a was a Stanford grad, Stanford MBA, Navy nuke guy. Uh, a friend of mine from West Point already worked at Stryker as an operations guy. So when they talked to me about an operations role there, you know, there was some, you know, some people that I already knew there, some people that had relatively similar experiences. And the company, Stryker at the time, under John Brown, you know, had prided itself on, you know, 20% growth year on year. And they had done it for like 15 years in a row or something. So the company was really in a in, in an exponential growth mode. So it was uh, it, it it was a good fit, and I didn't have to move, which was which was even better. So okay, so but you weren't there all that long because you shortly after went to Stanford Business School yourself mm-hmm. and earned your MBA. Why the MBA? So the um, the individual that I, I mentioned, the the Navy nuke guy who who I worked for, you know, Stanford undergrad, Stanford MBA. You know, after I'd been there about a year and a half or so, pulled me aside and said, you know, I think you really should think about getting an MBA. And I, actually, I can remember having kind of an interesting conversation with him about, ah, I don't think I really need it. This is good. I think I'm doing a good job. He goes, oh, no, 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 you're doing a great job. He goes, but if you want to go to kind of the next level, you know, either in this company or in other companies, I think it's really important for you to, uh, to consider to consider getting an MBA. So, so I listened, did the GMAT prep course and applied to, and was fortunate enough to get into Stanford. So after about a year and a half, I started all over again, Stanford, which was a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Having gone to West Point as your undergraduate piece, it was really nice for two years to be in shorts and Tevas and a, and a t-shirt for two years worth of classes at Stanford. Yeah. So after you graduated, you worked briefly as a consultant for the APM group. Then you transitioned to working at UMass Memorial, where you quickly rose to be the vice president of operations. How did you come to be in healthcare delivery? So I think it started really at, at Stanford. There, at Stanford, in my class, there was, um, uh, there was six or seven physicians who were there on a grant to have physician leaders with MBAs. And the, um, I ended up literally like palling around with a couple of them. We were racing mountain bikes. So we were, you know, we were doing triathlons and everything. And so I started taking some of, when it came time for the elective classes, started taking some classes. Alan Antoven was teaching some, some high level economic healthcare delivery classes. We took a couple classes over, over at Stanford university outside of the business school. So when it, I knew I, I, I had a pretty good idea. I wanted to do consulting. I wasn't really interested in eye banking or anything like that coming out of Stanford. And when I interviewed with a number of the consultants, APM was one of the, one of the firms that was there. And I ended up being accepted for their summer internship program. And at the time, obviously as a non-clinician, you know, I was a little hesitant about like, uh, you know, well, I'm not a, I'm not a, I haven't been a nurse. I haven't been a physician, but a lot of what goes on in healthcare delivery is really operational things. It's, you know, it's, it's process and it's throughput and it's length of stay management and it's productivity and those things. So, uh, it was a, um, uh, it was an interesting opportunity to work with them on a consulting basis. We did projects from children's Pittsburgh to the Ken Norris cancer center out at USC strategy jobs for the university health system consortium. And then my last client, was was UMass Memorial. Ah, okay. So that's the connection. Right. So so as their as your last client, they they offered you a, a an Yeah, I had um, we had moved from California back to uh, back to the East Coast after my wife's mom passed away very suddenly. Uh, we had two very small kids and I, the the constant travel hmm. was was starting to be, you know, it, it, not a, an issue, but it was you know, I, I was looking for somebody, something a little more stable. When I got to, to UMass and started working with the CEO and the COO there, they took me out to dinner and said, we'd really like to not have to have outside consultants every time we have a problem. Would you be interested in developing your own, our own consulting group? They, at the time, they had, I think, 10 or 11 affiliated hospitals and so I put together a business plan 
And ultimately, that's what I did for them for the next couple of years. We had management engineers, I had finance people, I had a couple of clinicians, and we did productivity, we did staffing, we did supply chain, a lot of operational improvements for the organization over, uh, over the next couple of years as an internal group. So you weren't just looking at the main hospital, you were actually looking at the whole system. Right. So okay. we, we, would, um, we, we looked at the main hospital, kind of law of, law of big numbers, right? Sure. You know, if there's opportunity there, let's get it there. But we also looked at some of their, their own facilities, their own community hospitals, and then opportunities, particularly around the supply chain, with some of the affiliated hospitals. Interesting. So that must have given you an interesting perspective on all the all the operations of of the organization, both the larger facility as well as some of the smaller facilities. Well, it, it, it did, and, and I think what it did for me is realize that at some point I would I would want to transition from kind of a, a, a more consultative role for the organization to actually being responsible for driving the performance and driving the improvement and uh, being responsible for the broader piece, which is ultimately how I ended up transitioning from running their performance improvement into the VP of Ops role. Okay. So how long were you actually in the VP of Ops role? So I think we did the merger with Memorial, so probably two and a half years or so. And was that role just at the main facility or was that a system level role? So that was that was at the main facility and at the time we had merged with Memorial, which was the other one of the other large facilities in Worcester. So it was over both of those campuses originally and then we went back to a, a campus specific model. So I went back to just the university campus. It seems like maybe you found your niche at this point in terms of healthcare delivery, healthcare operations. At what point did you say, you know what, this is what I want to do with my professional career? It, it's an interesting question. I, I joke with people. I'm still trying to figure out okay. if you know if this is what this is what I want to do. But uh-huh. you know, I I had cut my teeth on uh, from a healthcare operations piece for a while. Certainly, in the years doing the consulting and the consulting for UMass gave you a, a really broad understanding of how the delivery system worked and then moving from the consulting side into an operational role where you're really responsible for the day-to-day and managing the people and managing the resources it uh, I'm an you know at the end of the day I've always kind of felt that I'm an operator so I just happen to be an operator doing it for healthcare which is a great mission working with really good people that every day want to try to make a difference you know for people so I think it, to be perfectly honest, I think it kind of snuck up on me. Okay. It wasn't a plan. I mean, no. your background cl- didn't say, didn't scream, I'm going to be a healthcare executive. Yeah. You know, like, let's see. I was jumping from helicopters <laughs> and now I'll be a healthcare executive. Right. right? right yeah. Right. <laughs> so in 2003, you became the president and CEO of Marlboro Hospital, uh, which is a member of the uh, member hospital of the UMass system. You were pretty young at that point. At this, I'm guessing about. Yeah, you were I think, maybe I think at 40? the time I I was the youngest CEO in uh, in Massachusetts at the That's time. Impressive. So yeah. So how did how did how were you selected for that role? So the um, the the former CEO was leaving to go to a, uh, a healthcare system up in Buffalo, and uh, I had worked with her before on a couple operational issues. And when the job came open, I went to the CEO of of UMass Memorial and said, you know, I've been doing this VP of Ops piece for a while. He was relatively new in the role. And his original, his initial response was, I don't want you to go. You know, I need you. Marlboro is a small community hospital. The UMass Memorial is kind of the 800 pound gorilla of the system. We need the opportunity, you know, we need you to continue to drive the, the performance here. But I had a couple conversations with him, and you know, I think at the end of those, he you know ended up being very supportive of okay, if this is something you want to do, you should put your hat in the ring. It was a full outside search that that the organization that Marlboro had had pulled together, and it boiled down to I was one of the finalist candidates, and then there was an uh, an individual from outside the system. Candidly, I think the from what I found out afterwards, the physicians had actually almost completely uh, wanted the outside person. And it wasn't, and it wasn't, I don't think it was much about me. It was an issue of, they thought that they were gonna get a UMass person 
and not somebody that was really focused on Marlboro and making, doing the things that Marlboro needed. You so know, they were worried about your loyalty? Yeah, they were worried, you know, is this just going to be a figurehead for, you know, UMass is going to tell us what to do and everything. So for me, the first couple years was really establishing myself with the organized medical staff around, you know, at the end of the day, I am a part of the UMass, we are a part of the UMass Memorial System, but it's my job to make, to, to do the things that Marlboro needed to do in order to improve. And over time, it didn't take forever, but over that year, I think people really started, certainly the clinicians understood that I was 100% dedicated to, to Marlboro and its success. And, and I think it, you know, they saw it through going back to the system and fighting a number of battles on behalf of Marlboro, where had I been a just a UMass guy, would have rolled over and said, "Oh well, the system told us we had to do this." So, so it worked out. Uh, it worked out well. What was it about going to the CEO role that really intrigued you and made you want to do that? I had been the um, uh, I had been the VP of Ops for a while, and you know I think the thing that um, that was exciting to me about the CEO role is kind of being in that seat and being responsible at an even broader level. So a VP of ops role, you're, you're very focused on operations. The CEO role, there's board relations, there's a treasury function, there's foundation and fundraising that you have to do, there's care and feeding of the communities that you serve. So I just looked at it as, a, as a, something I wanted to do. I thought I was ready to do it, and uh, it was something I was really interested in going after. And had it not been at Marlboro, over some period of time, it probably would have been someplace else. So. Okay. UMass Memorial's about 800 beds. Mm -hmm. So how, how does how does Marlboro come? Small. So we were a 79-bed community hospital. Okay. Been around for a little over 100 years. Had a, um, a full service minus OB. They had stopped doing obstetrics 15 years before that. But a strong orthopedic group, good cardiology group. The emergency room was staffed by clinicians from UMass Memorial, so we had really high quality emergency ED docs in the community, uh, and then a number of other services, rheumatology and some of the other areas. So much smaller scale, which allowed you to really have a very personal touch on everything. You know, you knew the names of Every employee, you knew, you know, you knew about their families. You knew all the docs. You knew what was going on with them, uh, and it was, um, which was, a, which was a great environment. You raised the issue of the the, the physicians having some concern about about you. So tell us a little bit about how how does that work? Why why the physicians? Explicitly had a a voice in the in the selection process. How did, what because that's kind of something kind of unique about healthcare. Yeah. So in in this instance, the um, the organized medical staff and and it's changed now over time. But at the time, the vast majority of the organized medical staff was private physicians, private practice physicians, not employed that, by the hospital. Not employed by the hospital, and this was before a lot of the affiliation models that we see now. So actually totally independent, did not have a physician hospital organization where there would at least be shared goals and some alignment, you know, had an independent, an independent physician organization that they did their own contracting with separate and apart from the hospital. And in that kind of model, I think the only employed physicians that we had at the time when I started there were the emergency department physicians and, and anesthesiologists, kind of hospital-based services. Mm -hmm. The ortho group, private. The cardiology groups, private. The, all the primary care physicians were, were private. So in, in those models, and, and the model has changed somewhat over time, the private physicians wielded a, a significant amount of power in the organization because they make the determination about, well, am I going to continue to bring my surgeries here or do I go to the competitor? You know, do I continue to send my admits to you or do I send them someplace else? So it's always it has and it continues this way to, to, a, to a degree. It is a real balance between creating the right environment where the clinicians want to come and bring their services there and the power that they have over being able to do that. What surprised you about becoming president and CEO for the first time? I, I, I don't know if there was any like real surprise. I think the, the things that were, were of interest is 
how many things you had to be juggling at any given time. So as, if we're doing a capital campaign, in addition to running the hospital and being responsible for those finances, you're spending a tremendous amount of time meet and greet functions. And as one of the biggest employers in the community, there is the expectation of well, you're going to be a member of the chamber. And then ultimately I served as uh, the president of the chamber for uh, years. You know, there's a number of other things where there's just an expectation for you to be there. And I think when I came to the role, I, I was confident from my my ability to run operations and certainly work with the clinicians. The, the piece that I didn't realize as much is how much outside of the building that time was going to take. Luckily, I lived the next town over, so it was, we were doing a lot of events at night, and I can remember my wife who works for Congressman McGovern, Marlboro was in his district, so a lot of the community events actually worked out great because she was there representing the congressman and I'm there representing the hospital. So, so it's kind, a company of, tool. kind of date night, you know, <laughs> you know I was like, oh, what, what function are we doing tonight? Are you going to be there? Yes. Oh, okay, great. I'll see you there. So, okay. So you served as president and CEO of Marlboro until 2011 when you became the president of St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. What made you decide to leave Marlboro at that point in time and take on the president role at, at St. Elizabeth's? So I had gotten a call from uh, an individual at, uh, at, at then Steward, who was the COO of the system, Bob Guyon, a uh, retired lieutenant colonel, uh, a really great healthcare leader. And he called me to, if I would come in and have a conversation with him. At that point, I had been at Marlboro for eight years. The average lifespan of a CEO is three, three and a half. But I had always felt at Marlboro there was so much work to be done. And ultimately, as I was getting close to the end of the eight years, we had completely turned the finances of the organization around. We had started an aggressive recruitment to bring primary care, employed primary care doctors, uh, physicians in. After beating the drum with Southboro Medical Group for years, we had created all new space in their building where we had outpatient women's imaging and we had our endoscopy center there and a number of other things. So that relationship had been settled. We were getting ready to break ground on a cancer center. And I think at that point I started thinking, I wasn't actively seeking anything, but I was like, you know, I'm kind of ready. If somebody called me, I might be ready to take the next step in terms of a, a larger organization. And I had gotten the call from Bob to come in and met with him here in Boston. And he, he pitched me on this idea of running St. Elizabeth's, which was the academic teaching hospital for the, for the, the relatively new Stewart system. It came out of the old Caritas system, bigger program, teaching program with residents. There was research going on, an opportunity to, to move from a small community hospital to an academic teaching center here in Boston. And, and I, the opportunity to work for Bob was really appealing. He was a, he's a really strong healthcare leader and uh, he did a pretty good pitch. So, uh, so yeah. that, that's how I ended up at St. E's. You mentioned it's a teaching hospital. Given the larger scale, the teaching, all these other additional things that you took on, what was it like making that jump then from smaller community hospital up to a teaching hospital. Yeah, I think the I think the change wasn't wasn't so much around uh, the um, the the teaching versus the non teaching. I, I would say that the the big change that I had was the um, the big change was more around the function of going from a, a not for profit system to a for profit system. And you know, I, I used to joke with folks that, you know, I looked at, you know, the numbers were always important to us at Marlboro. Obviously, when I got there, we were struggling financially. We had to do, you know, a number of really difficult things, you know, in terms of aligning the operations. But as I joked, I think I looked at more numbers in the first six months at St. Elizabeth's than I had in eight years at Marlboro. And, and it's, it's a little bit of a stretch, but we were much more proactive about things. So instead of waiting until the end of the month and going, oh, geez, what happened to our surgeries this month? You know, you're looking at, you know, your surgeries the first week and you're looking at them the second week. And if they're not there, the you know, question is, is can we pull surgeries in from next month or do we staff the, the ORs down and being much more proactive around 
uh, around managing the uh, the organization. So the the teaching piece, uh, I, it's it's great with the medical students and the residents there. To me, that was kind of another piece of the program. Mm-hmm. The the real change was this going from a much more kind of a, a little more reactive mode to a, a very proactive mode. You know, what's our staffing today? How's it set up for tomorrow? Do we have uh, we right now here at Steward? We have we use predictive analytics. We had brought in Data Robot to help us build a predictive uh, model around our volume, taking into account seasonality and ED volumes and surgical schedules and you know socioeconomic factors. So right now, about two weeks out, I can I, I have about a ninety seven percent accuracy on what my volume on the inpatient units will be next week. You think about what that means from a staffing perspective, I can staff in a much more effective way if I know a week and a half from now what I'm gonna have to staff because I can pull in per diems or I can, or if I have to flex down, I know how to do that and I I already have that instead of having staff show up that morning and going, oh, I'm sorry, there's no patients here. Do you want to flex down, which is never a good conversation to be having with the staff. So, oh. And is that at the system level? So we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead, but is that at the system level now? This this knowledge is pushed down throughout your, the steward system? It's one of the things that um, our model is the, um, the, the local hospitals are, the, the leadership teams there are really strong operators, you know, strong on operations, you know, strong in working with their organized medical staff. And incentivized around quality patient safety and the patient experience a lot of the tools with our model we do run from a corporate perspective and cascade those out to everyone so that we've got some consistency around doing that and if you think about it you know we went from eight hospitals to 16 with the chs the community health systems acquisition to now 34 with ultimately when the uh, the iasis transaction closes it's really important for us to do that. Otherwise, we'd have 34 different approaches to how we're looking at staffing or how we're looking at scheduling or how we're looking at doing pre-certs or authorizations. So part of our model is taking, taking the things that can be routinized out, doing them in a consistent way and sending them back to the team so their focus really is on operations, growing volume, quality, quality safety, and the patient experience. So. Fascinating. So a point I wanted to ask you about, and you, since you brought up, you know, a big change for you was going from the nonprofit to the for-profit. Some people think that healthcare should not be for-profit. Uh, how do you respond to that? So uh, we actually look at, and I, I, I do believe this, it's not so much for-profit and non-profit, it's tax-paying and non-tax-paying is the difference. I think if you looked at a number of not-for-profit systems, and you looked at their earnings, and you looked at what they do from a community benefit perspective, I would argue the taxes we pay in the community and our commitment, Stewart's commitment to continue the level of community benefits that we had done prior to the conversion to for-profit, we support the communities as much as as anybody. And the differential again is, it's I have a not-for-profit status, but based on my balance sheet if i look like a if i look like a fortune 100 company whether i'm a not for profit or a for profit there's a lot of revenue in there it sounded like you were saying the culture difference though between the for profit and the not for profit is this much more forward thinking yeah well i think for yeah. us i think for us it, it we have to be you know yeah. we're if you think about the the caritas system that ultimately became steward it was a it was a bankrupt system underneath the diocese. At one point, we tried to uh, this is before I came. We tried to sell the system to a number of a number of other large religious healthcare systems. Could not give it away for a dollar. We would give it away for a dollar, and the systems nobody wanted. Nobody wanted it. Wow. You know, and I think part of the challenge is there was there was a lot of debt. There was significant pension obligations, which we've subsequently covered and and cleaned up. And we're in, you know, we're not in the, we're in tough communities. You know, we're, we're not in some of the, the, the more affluent communities in the Commonwealth. You know, we're in, 
communities that have oftentimes struggled, Fall River, Taunton, Dorchester, Methuen, Haverhill, high, high degree of government payer, high degree of Medicaid in those. So for us, having to be able to do all the things that our not-for-profit colleagues do and do it with a significantly worse payer mix and not necessarily the rates that some of the other larger systems get require us and you know we want we want new emergency departments which we've replaced i think six of the emergency departments already we we need we want the latest and greatest equipment or at least our clinicians do so there's investments there there's investments in the plant and infrastructure that we want to be a part of so in order to do that and no one's handing us out the dollars to do that so we have to do it ourselves which means we have to be much more proactive about how we manage things so that we can invest back into our staff and our facilities and ultimately the community. So you were at St. Elizabeth's for not quite two years when in 2013 you were appointed to be the Secretary of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services for the state of Massachusetts. How, did, how does one come to be the Secretary of EOHHS? So I had, um, uh, I had gotten a call from the governor's office one night and they were they had told me that they were looking to make a change in the secretary role and the, the conversation went on and i was talking to the governor's chief of staff and i had said well let me look through i, I i'm certainly glad to help my wife had done some work for for the governor in in his two election campaigns uh, and I, so i knew the governor i had met him a number of times and I said, well, let me look through my contact list and I'll see if I, if I, I know somebody. Uh, and his chief of staff said, no, I'm, I'm calling to ask you if you'd be interested. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, oh, um, I, I was totally kind of flabbergasted by it. So I went and talked to the governor and it was a great conversation. And I said to him, you know, governor, no disrespect, but I am not a policy guy. I'm not, I, I don't, I, I said, I'm relatively intelligent and I can figure things out. But if you're looking for somebody who's totally brushed up on healthcare policy or health, how the healthcare delivery system works from a government perspective, that's probably not me. And he very quickly said, we have a lot of people that can do that. He goes, what I need is somebody to help come in and lead the organization. And we talked a little bit, and I said, well, that's something I can do. If you've got the subject matter experts to know about how, you know, ultimately we're going to have to respond to the Zika virus, or I'm gonna to have to, you know, have policy procedures around what we're gonna do around the opioid crisis, and you really want somebody to help lead and manage these, these state agencies, that I would be interested in. So. One more conversation after that, and you know, he asked me to uh, to serve out the uh, with him the rest of his term as as the secretary. Wow! So, what is the scope of HHS in Massachusetts? So, here in Massachusetts, EOHHS is 15 state agencies. It's about 22,000 employees, and uh, at the time, it was about a 19 billion dollar budget, which is a little more than half the state budget at the time. The agencies are primarily the, the social service and support agencies for the Commonwealth. So it was the Medicaid program, MassHealth, it was the Department of Public Health, the Department of Mental Health, Veteran Services, which for me was fantastic because as a combat vet, I got to work with Secretary Coleman Nee, who worked for me, providing veteran services across the entire Commonwealth. We had two soldiers' homes, one in Chelsea and one in Holyoke, which are in effect, nursing homes for our, our World War II, Korea and Vietnam vets primarily. Department of Developmental Services, Department of Transitional Sur uh, Assistance, which is the welfare program, Department of Children, Youth and Families. So it was a broad, broad spectrum of the, uh, the social safety net programs that the Commonwealth has, so. What was most challenging for you making that? So you, you had some familiarity with healthcare operations. Right. So you probably were natural with some of the healthcare side, but what was most, cha most challenging to you in that role? Finding enough time to get read into all of, all of the things that were going on was really a challenge. You know, I think, I think in each of those agencies, you had either a commissioner 
or an executive running them. So you know, on a day-to-day basis, it was the, the agencies ran. I think the, the biggest challenge that, that I found is, to be perfectly candid, there were things that you would look at a problem and you would have a relatively rational kind of operational approach given kind of my background and then realize that in order to do that, you had to not only get the governor on board and his staff, get the Senate on board, get the House on board, get the advocates on board. And you know, by the time you went through that whole process, sometimes your solution looked very different than what you would had originally envisioned because you had to go through all of these multiple screens to do things. So, so that was, as somebody who's, I think, a little more action oriented, that was a challenge because at the end of the day, you're like, let's do it. This is what we should do. Right. Right. And they're like, well, secretary, we've got to, you know, the regulations aren't set up like that. So in order for us to change that, we'll have to change the regulations, which means we have to go to the secretary of state to do this. And so, so that was, uh, that was the, the one challenge. I think the one thing that was really interesting, and I, I've had this conversation with any number of people, there's this perception of the, the the state worker who's just kind of running the chain out and uh, kind of doing what there's, you know, a, sta- a typical state worker. I did not see that. I mean, every organization has that. I saw really smart, really hardworking people who are paid at a state pay scale, which is not anything to write home to mom about, who were there at seven o'clock in the morning and they're working on policies and, and procedures at seven, seven o'clock at night or coming in on the weekend. So, you know, whenever anybody says, oh, what was it like to work with all the, the bureaucrats? And I'm like, well, there is a lot of bureaucracy. There's no question, but there's a lot of incredibly hardworking people trying to make a difference too. So it was 2013 when you took over. What were the most pressing policy issues that you were dealing with, whether it was in healthcare or, 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 or the, any of the other number of responsibilities? So, so I think you know we had any number of, of major major things going on. First, when I first stepped in, it started on January 22nd, and I think within that week, I had to make a, a decision on whether or not I was going to retain the commissioner of the Department of Transitional Assistance. It had recently on or about the day that I started, it had come out that there had been a, a, an auditor's report came out about some significant welfare fraud using the EBT cards here in Massachusetts. And it set off a whole chain of events around photographs on the EBT cards and whether that was acceptable to the federal government or not and how you did that. So the, the Department of Transitional Assistance, so I did ultimately you know, remove that commissioner and put uh, an individual in who had been the chief of staff in that role as really a strong operator to try to address that. I think throughout the course of the first few months, we had issues with the Department of Transitional Assistance. There was ongoing issues with the Department of Children and Families, the DCF, in terms of the caseworkers. We had some some real tragedies from that had befallen children here in the Commonwealth under DCF's watch. The Commonwealth had voted in medical marijuana. They gave the Department of Public Health the responsibility of implementing the medical marijuana statute, which was incredibly challenging. At the end of the day, the Department of Public Health is used to working with home health agencies and hospitals and everybody else, not necessarily the kind of folks that originally had applied to take over the medical marijuana dispensaries. They, they were not all knights on white horses, you know. <laughs> Say it isn't so. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you know, so we were basically legitimizing what was in effect a, uh, uh, an illegal substance every place else. So it was some real challenges there. Uh, you know, and then I think that the, one of the other, there's just ongoing things that happen. If you think about 22,000 people managing across those 15 state agencies around all the social safety net programs. Invariably, there's going to be challenges. The last big one that we had was when the Affordable Care Act went into the place. The Health Connector, which I was on the board of, was responsible for standing up our own website. And it was initially, it was a real failure, as did a number of exchanges across the country fail. So we had brought Optum in and we had brought in a number of other folks, HCentive and others, to help us recast, fix, and then move forward on the, uh, 
on the uh, the website. Okay. What would you say are your were your biggest accomplishments during that time? So I, you know, I would say a, a, a couple things. The uh, we were able to um, uh, before I left, we signed a, a forty billion dollar waiver for with the federal government for ongoing support over the next five years for the Medicaid program. Uh, it had support for a number of our disproportionate share hospitals, support for the uh, the Medicaid population. So that was uh, that was a, a, a huge undertaking. You know, we had a lot of incredibly hardworking people in Mass Health helping us kind of get it over the finish line. A lot of late nights going back and forth with the federal government about getting that done. I say the um, one of the other big ones. You know, that I had talked about DTA before transitional assistance. We had been slapped with about a thirty million dollar penalty for it it had to do with mailing information out that didn't include voter right applications which is a federal requirement we weren't the state had not been doing that before i got there so the usda fined us 30 million dollars so it was a major we did a major negotiation with uh with the usda and the the fns to instead of paying 30 million dollars we would invest $30 $30 million in our core systems to help better manage the population. And so that was a, a tremendous, you know, a big negotiation. They wanted the money. We didn't want to give them the money, right. you know, so, but we, we put in a commitment to spend the money to actually improve the systems that would ensure that that didn't happen again. So that saved the state from just doling the money back to the federal government. And then, you know, on a personal level, while I was the secretary, we had this, the ongoing saga of a young woman who had been seen at Boston Children's, who ultimately had been remanded by the courts into DCF custody. And it became a, it went viral. It was a national issue. Mike Huckabee was talking about it. They were on the Dr. Phil show and ultimately negotiating with the courts, with DCF, with the families, and with all the providers, a way to to get her to ultimately be able to go home in a safe manner. It took about 15 months of the time to ultimately do, but we uh, were able to finish it just shortly before I left as a secretary. So you left EOHHS in, in 2015, and, and that was because the governor's term had right. run out. And you came, at that point, you came back to the steward healthcare, uh, where you took on, rather than going back to your CEO role, you took on first the executive vice president for insurance and physician operations, and then most recently, and and now the executive vice president for the hospital services group. So before we kind of talk about your your current role, let's talk, and we've talked a little bit about steward already, Mm -hmm. but let's, let's talk about kind of steward where it is today. What are the major components of the system? So you mentioned the number of hospitals. Right. So, so the, the, um, the, the hospital, the organization is set up really as a, as a series of business units. So we have, until our most recent acquisitions, we had this hospital services group where all of the acute care and my long-term care hospital would sit. That, that's the organization that I'm now overseeing. We have a, a large physician enterprise, Steward Medical Group, or Steward Hospital Physician Services, which is where we have at, here in the Commonwealth about 750 employed providers, including mid-levels. And then we have the Steward Healthcare Network, which is our managed care contracting. It's where we do our accountable care. You know, so when we ha- we're in Pioneer and now NextGen, it's where you know, we've been accepted as one of the pilot organizations in the, Medicaid, the new Medicaid ACO program here in Massachusetts. So it's, again, until we purchase the recent CHS facilities, which just adds another hospital group, the kind of the central group. We haven't come up with whatever the final name of it's going to be. So it's right now it's two hospital, two hospital groups, our original steward facilities, the new CHS facilities, steward medical group stays as, as a, uh, a business group. And we'll do that on a national basis. And then steward healthcare network is where we do all of our accountable care. And ultimately we'll have an insurance product in there. One of the times we delayed this this interview was because you were going through the CH, mm. CHS um, acquisition, and, and now you're in negotiations with IASIS uh, Healthcare to add another 17 hospitals. So you you went when you when you had the 
the first acquisition I just mentioned, you acquired, was it eight hospitals in mm -hmm. Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida? So you had been kind of centric to New England. Then you extended out kind of uh, along the East Coast and then and, and towards, the, towards the Midwest. And now with AASIS, you're going to move out into the South and the West so that Stewart ultimately has, I believe, presence in 10 states. Right. Is that right? What kind of... Uh, uh, leadership challenges is that going to represent, and 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 kind of how is that changing the organization? Yeah, it 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 absolutely it absolutely presents some leadership challenges, and part of it is as we've we've brought on certainly the community health organizations, and IASIS won't close until later this year. So those challenges, we're, we're just starting the conversations with them in terms of their management teams and structures. You know, I think the the main challenge is. As we did the purchase, we it was a little bit like the you know the dog finally catching the car. Like okay, we we've, we've been talking about this for a while. We've now caught the car. Okay, now what do we do? And, and not so much what do we do, but boy, you know we went from we basically doubled our size. We certainly didn't double our management team and double the support. So everybody, I think everybody in the organization has been working tremendously hard. To, uh, to try to do the integration and trying to grow the system in a really thoughtful way. The, the easiest thing to do would be like, oh, well, if we have one of these, we now need two of these. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody has been very committed to really looking at it and saying, well, do we need two of those or do we need a different model or is one and a half of those going to be sufficient and can manage the operation? So the, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, as we run into each other in and around, there's a lot of, how you doing? Everything okay? You know, because people are on planes going back and forth. You don't see them for a week or so. It's like, oh, I was, I was in Florida for the week and then, or I was, I was in Ohio and then Pennsylvania and I just got back today. So the challenge is, I think, taking our model, which we think has been very successful here in Massachusetts, applying that in some of these other markets which is which are very different than what those markets are very different than what we have here in massachusetts and doing that in a in a thoughtful and rational way because at the end of the day we still have to we still have to again drive enough performance so that we can invest in ourselves and invest in our staff and invest in the community so what scales well and what is maybe where you do have to kind of double or, you know, as you double in size. Yeah. You know, I think, I think there's a, a number of things and we had already, as we had talked about earlier in terms of how we do the model, we've pulled a lot of those services that are scalable into a corporate function. So our, we have a central billing office that does the, all the billing and collecting for the entire system. We have centralized all the I, information technology and, and systems at a corporate level. So at the local level, there are technicians and techs, the computer breaks or if the printer dies or anything, but we really support that from a centralized level. So things that I think work well centrally legal. It's you know, it's a legalized. It's a it's a it's easy to centralize the function. The billing and collection process. Our HR and benefits is much easier to do from a centralized approach as opposed to everybody having their own individual HR policies and procedures and benefits. And then the the other things that that we're doing from a centralized perspective are we continue to be centralized in our approach around our medical group, the Steward Medical Group. The things that have to be done locally are the things that we do locally here at the hospital. So we we need all the hospital presidents to be really strong operators. We need the, you know their teams to be operationally focused and figuring out ways to work with their clinicians to grow the volume in their respective markets. So I think what we're taking is the model that we had tried that we had done here scaling up the pieces that we need here from a facilities perspective or an IT perspective or a legal perspective, and then trying to overlay them over the, uh, the, other, um, the other acquisitions. How did, how did you make the choices about the acquisitions? Was it did just their availability or was it a, some sort of fit that you saw, a potential fit that you saw? Or how, how, do, how do you go about making those choices? Yeah, I think, I think two separate issues. One with the community health systems. Community was required to divest themselves because of some of their covenants of a number of facilities. So a number of the, the, the places that we were able to buy, while we're very excited to have them in the steward system, if you looked at them, our geography in Massachusetts, we have this 
this daisy chain from northern Massachusetts up in Methuen and Haverhill down to Fall River, kind of down eastern Massachusetts. You know, almost every one of our hospital systems, either primary or secondary service area, tend to touch each other at certain points. So it's a really logical progression. Obviously, you look at us on the map now with CHS, that Ohio, you know, the Ohio and Western Pennsylvania really have that system. Florida has that with the three that are there. We have one hospital in, in Bethlehem that doesn't necessarily tie with the, some of the other ones. So again, while we're very excited to have them, part of it was what CHS was, was willing and or interested in diverting. IASIS is a little different because it's the entire company is being merged in. So you didn't really have, that came kind of as a package. Right. What they had done in Utah and Arizona and Texas, and I think there's one in, uh, in Louisiana, that came as a part of the system. Okay. What's, so you want to take the model that you developed here in New England, you're, you're starting to push that out to the CHS acquisition and presumably eventually the IASIS. What's the process of, of kind of bringing the steward model to a f- facility that had not been under your, your leadership in the past? So I think, it's, I think it's been a couple things. One, and we went through these growing pains here, the, the original Caritas system truly operated as six independent entities. They did not have shared governance documents. They didn't have consistent bylaws for the board, consistent bylaws for their medical executive committees, consistent policies and procedures. So one of the first things we're doing is going in, and now some of this is now subject to ensuring that as we're changing the bylaws that they're consistent with whatever the state's laws are in that respective state. But the, the first thing is setting, an oper- setting a baseline for the operating model of here's, here's our consistent policies and procedures, here's our consistent bylaws for the medical executive committees, you know, for the medical staff and the boards. Here's what we're doing. Here's our approach to employee benefits so that our employees here are being treated you know, the same and are fairly in terms of the benefit packages that they that they are in the other places, so there's an there's an operational piece where we're applying our you know how we look at our staffing and labor and productivity. We're rolling out our supply chain initiatives because we always think that there's some opportunity there. So there's some true operational pieces done. I think the other big piece is aligning the work that we've done with our employed medical group and with Steward Healthcare Network in terms of contracting with the individuals. And remember, we talked about at Marlboro where the hospital and the physician group were basically two separate entities. That model doesn't work in the new healthcare world of accountable care and taking risks. So there really has to be more alignment with the physicians. So Steward Healthcare Network is out doing roadshows in all the communities to have those, um, those providers sign up with us so that we have shared contractual alignment on both the hospital and the physician side, which puts us in a much stronger position to have conversations with the payers. So operational approach, kind of day-to-day, daily care and feeding in the organization. And and candidly, we're also looking at CHS didn't do some of the capital investments that we think are important. So it's taking a look at, have they been capital starved? And if so, what's a logical capital plan to get them on, which the local facilities love because some, you know, at some level, I think they feel like someone's paying attention to them now. So. so let's talk briefly, specifically about your role now as the executive vice president for the hospital services group. What is that role? What's the scope of it? And then kind of how does it fit into the, the rest of the leadership structure at Stewart? Uh-huh. So the, the hospital services group is, as of right now, is all the, um, all the facilities, the eight acute care facilities and the, uh, the long-term acute care facility, are my New England Sinai down in, in Stoughton. So my responsibilities, all eight of those organizations report directly to me. So from a, from a P&L perspective, I am, you know, I am responsible for how they're doing from a volume perspective, how they're doing from a budget perspective, what we're going to do in terms of capital investment in those. I've structured this where I have a chief operating officer working for me and a chief financial officer and a number of other individuals to help oversee and, and manage that. 
Our job is not to run the hospitals on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I have those management teams there. But our job is because we've skinnied down the management teams to be much more operationally focused to give them the tools from a corporate perspective that they can use to help better manage their business at the local level. Will all of the hospitals, once the, all these acquisitions are settled, will they all report to you then in, that, in your role? No, so I think what um, the way that we're, we're focused on sh the structure is just from a scale perspective, I will continue to run all of the, the facilities here in the Commonwealth or in the Northeast, depending on whether or not we continue to grow some additional facilities here. And then there will be an individual, my counterpart, will run those, we'll, we'll do that same thing for the, um, uh, for the central region. So we'll have two regional approaches to the way the hospital runs, mainly because at some level, as a, part of the, as a part of the acquisitions of CHS, there's a lot of work to be done there to get them to where they should be from, a, from an earnings perspective and from address the capital that we talked about and the staffing and the alignment model. At the end of the day, we're, we, the, the hospital business unit here, are, we are the primary driver of earnings. So what, talking to the CEO, I think we've, he and I agree that my focus has really got to be on, we don't have any hiccups here. He is out continuing to grow the system and those, he'll put people in place to help drive the volume there. He needs to make sure, you know, he needs to be confident that we've got this here and that, you know, we're not, while he's out growing the system, we're not slipping here in Massachusetts. So, so there'll, there's, there's you kind of over the hospital operations for a portion of the system. There's going to be, or is going to be another person like you who's going to have another, the other portion. The central. Of the mm -hmm. Who else is kind of at your level? Yeah, so right now it's, you know, the, there's the CEO of the organization. Until the acquisitions, it was me running the hospital services group. We had a, a physician leader running Steward Medical Group and then a, another physician leader running the Steward Healthcare Network. So those were the three business unit, now four, with the new acquisitions reporting directly to the CEO. And of course, the CEO has a CFO and a general counsel and marketing communications reporting to him as, as staff positions. But from a, from a business unit driver, there's the three of us, now four, with the community acquisitions reporting directly to the CEO. CEO. What makes Steward so successful? Why, why is it working as well as it does? So, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's a couple things. You know, without, without sounding like too much of a sycophant, I think a big part of why Stewart is successful is Dr. Delatore. He is he's an he's an incredible driver of performance. He has real vision around, you know, he was the one who really helped develop and create the model that we're using now. And he is he's very aggressive about the model and wanting to to grow this model elsewhere. So our uh, a lot of our success is continuing to implement the ideas of how he is how he's laid out what the uh, the vision is going to be. So it, I think I think that's a part of the success. I think the other part has been you know, we've we've recruited a lot of people, a lot of really hardworking people who are, who feel like uh, I I forget the acronym. Well, you can figure out the acronym, but it's figure it out, get it done. No one is so hidebound around. Well, that's not my job. You know, I, I don't get involved in that. We're, it's a very supportive senior leader structure of each other. Uh, we jump in and help and put our shoulder to the wheel when it's needed. And we're, if you think about it, we're a, uh, before we did the IASIS deal, we we're a, a billion and a half dollar startup. You know, I mean, we've only been around for seven years. And in the course of the last year, We've doubled in size, and now with IASIS, we'll double again. So there, there is a real feel of entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurialism and, and growth, which attracts a, 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 attracts a certain kind of person. And we've been really fortunate to hire some really great individuals to help us with that. So as the executive vice president for the hospital services group, what keeps you up at night? What do you, what do you worry about most? So, so I... I, th I think the things that um, that really keep me up at night are, are a couple things. You know, one, 
I am very cognizant of the fact that as we have proceeded on this growth growth road, I have got to make sure that we here in Massachusetts continue to hit what we said we were going to do. So we've got to, you know, every day we're really focused on, you said we were going to get to this level in the budget. That's where we've got to get to. It's not really an option. You know, we have as a part of the, the recent MPT transaction where we, where they bought the, bought all, all of our facilities, there are, there are covenants in the documents that coverage covenants that we have to be at. I am, I am not going to oversee, you know, a hospital business unit that misses or comes close to missing the covenants. So that keeps me up at night because healthcare is very difficult. The, uh, there's, there's a few levers that you can pull around volume, but if you don't have a flu season, your ED is going to be pretty light for the month. If all the, finish, all the physicians go to their national meeting for a week, the OR might be quiet that month so, or that week. So that, that, is, that keeps me up. The other thing is I, I always feel, and this is where I, we have a chief medical officer who's been just a gem to work with because he feels the same way. You asked earlier about the, the not-for-profit, for-profit. You know, I, I think that there's kind of this stigma about the for-profit piece around, well, you're only interested in the numbers and not on the quality side. And that's not, that's not my frame of reference. That's my, not the lens that I look at things through. So when I was at Marlboro, we were the first community hospital to win the Betsy Lehman Patient Safety Award. And it was a lot of hard work by all of our staff to do that. That was important to me. We were, we spend as much time in our hospital close meetings where we're supposed to be talking about finances. We have 30 minutes, the first 30 minutes of that meeting starts with quality safety and the patient experience. The, the chief medical officer comes in, I have the entire senior leadership team, mine and the hospitals talking about, well, what's going on in your patient experience scores, your patient satisfaction scores, you know, what's going on with your, you know, your, your quality indicators, your falls, your serious reportable events, your nosocomial infections, what's going on with your ED throughput. Your ED throughput seems to be slowing down this month. Your ED door to dock time is off. What's going on with that? You know, that's driving your left without being seen. That's a quality metric. If someone came to the emergency department and left without being seen, that's a challenge. So the things that, in addition to, you know, what I had mentioned before, the things that keep me up is much like when I was at, at uh, EOHHS with 22,000 employees, we have 15,000 employees here. If everybody, if everybody came to work and you, you said, okay, everybody can have one bad day a year. Well, if 15,000 employees, somebody, you know, you've got a lot of people across the organization on any given day having a bad day. And so I think what keeps me up is we've got to get better on our patient experience because I think it's, it's a critical driver of people wanting to continue to come here. We've got to keep our leapfrog scores up. We had all but one of our hospitals were leapfrog A's. A couple of them dropped to B's because of the patient experience. Our focus is getting them back to leapfrog A's. We, you know, we want to make sure that, that the experience is good. And I almost feel like we have to do even better because people think, well, it's not important to you. It's like, okay, well, A, it is important to us. And B, we'll show you that it's important to us because here's the objective metrics. It's the leapfrog scores. It's our, it's our hospital compare scores, which we would put up against, which we want to put up against anybody. So let me transition and finish up with a few questions about leadership in particular. How would you encapsulate your leadership philosophy? So in general, I would say I try to give people the direction and the support they need. I am not a very good micromanager. I can do that if I have to, but I'd much rather have somebody come and say, here's what I've thought, here's how I'm going to manage it. Do you think it would work? Happy to give you feedback and input, having had a lot of experience in this to say, you may want to think about it this way. Remember that that could be a concern, but at the end of the day, it's finding for me, it's finding the right people and putting them in a, with the support they need so that they can ultimately be successful. Because otherwise, it becomes if every decision has to come all the way up the chain, we cannot be as nimble or as, as progressive as we need to be. Because there's just, I talked about this earlier, I do not want to be running eight different community hospitals. A, I, I can't, there's just not enough time in the day. And B, if that's the case, 
why do I have that management team there? They're there for a reason. They're there to be the, the, the key local leaders. So figuring out how to give them the support they need so that they can ultimately be successful. What are the characteristics and behaviors of a good leader? And how do you aspire to those yourself? So I think uh, the characteristics are you've got to be honest. Anytime there's any question about that, you've, you've lost. I think you have to be transparent around what you're trying to do and trying to accomplish. You have to be available. You know, when somebody calls with, with a question or an issue, you got to be available, which means, unfortunately, in, as healthcare continues to change and continues to grow and become even more complex, means you're available at night and you're available on the weekends and you're available on the holiday and you're available when you're out of the country. Because when somebody needs help, or need some guidance, you have to do that. Uh, uh, you have to do that uh, quickly. So, and then I think, in my mind, you you have to be. Uh, and this is probably the Boy Scout in me, courteous, kind. Yeah, I don't know if I go with obedient, uh, but cheerful, <laughs> thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Right. Yeah. I, I, to this day, send thank you notes to people when I hear things that you know where they've gone above and beyond. Or we had a CT tech. At, at one of our facilities, uh, a radiology tech who the regs just changed so he could no longer cross cover into, into CT, into CAT scan. So he took it upon himself to go back and within 60 days got his certification for the CAT scan. Dropped him a letter, you know, I, I heard about it kind of through the grapevine, dropped him a letter like, Brian, that was really tremendous what you did. Thanks for all you're doing. And those letters, I, uh, it drives my HR person crazy because I'm always asking, like, could you get this person's home address? Because I tend to send them a little handwritten note to their home address, which is incredibly powerful. And I think we've lost the, you know, we've lost a little bit the art of, of writing letters to people. And I've never forgotten when I would get letters from people, the kind of impact that has. And I've, I've done that when I was at Marlboro. I did it when I was at St. E's. I did it when I was a secretary. I was at a function, I was giving a talk to a number of students at Suffolk a couple months ago, and the, um, and we were talking, it was their capstone, and I was talking about a number of different things, and one of the people in the back sticks their hand up, because we were talking about leadership and everything, and uh, they, uh, the person said, you know, secretary, I guess the secretary title stays with me no matter what, but, you know, secretary, I just want to let you know, you know, and they, they were telling the rest of the class that, you know, what he's talking about matters. He goes, you may not remember, but you wrote to me. And, you know, after she had done something, you know, at one of our facilities and I got the letter and it came to my house and I opened it up and my whole family was sitting at the kitchen table when I opened it up. And I had this beautiful letter from you thanking me for what I had done and everything that made a difference. And so, um, so I do it till today. I still do it today. It's, you know, you do it at the end of the day, you knock them out over coffee on the weekend and it makes a big difference. I, I love that idea. And that's something we try to talk to our students about writing thank you letters as well. So that's a, a leadership success. Can you share maybe a leadership challenge that maybe you had to learn the hard way, a leadership lesson that maybe you had to learn the hard way? Yeah. You know, I think, I think the, you know, and, and I'm still learning them today, right? You know, sure. leadership, the, the path around leadership really never ends because there's always the, the industry changes, the environment changes. There's always something that, that that book, which I love, you know, what got you here won't get you there is, is fantastic. And I had an opportunity to sit with the author and talk to him a, a, on a number of occasions. I, I pull it out every couple of years and just reread it because I think it's relevant, right? You know, for me, one of the more recent ones is, you know, I had uh, ha been having a conversation with the CEO about an individual and I thought he was wrong. I, you know, I, I thought that the I... Individual or the CEO? No, I thought the CEO was wrong okay. um, about this individual. You know, and I thought, you know, I could get the person there through, through working and counseling and everything. And one of the things that, you know, certainly in our environment, I think... I, I learned from this is if you've got a, um, if there's a gut feel about something, you're better off making that move sooner rather than later. And in this instance, I thought I could fix it, but I, I wasn't really sure, but I, 
I didn't really have a solution to solve the pro that positional problem. So it was like, well, at least I've got somebody sitting there. And in hindsight, I'd have been better off having that very difficult conversation right up front and then starting a process to fill that because over the period of time, the damage that was done, which we're now uncovering, the damage that was done in the organization from not making that decision earlier on was, you know, we'll fix it. But I think what I learned was at the end of the day, you, if your gut says that, you know, you should do something, even if, even if you don't have a solution, you may be better off doing this. And he was right. And, and I have actually told him he's right, which <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> was always, always, always fun. Okay. What you were kind of describing was uh, maybe mentoring. You had a vision of being able to mentor this individual. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, whether you, did you have mentors earlier in your career or, and maybe now even? So I, you know, nothing, nothing as formal as like specific mentorship programs, but I had, you know, certainly the CEO at, at UMass Memorial, when he was there, I would, would call and ask him if I had a particularly thorny thing. I mean, the challenge is once you get to certain levels in the organization, you know, I actually think ha ha being able to phone a friend on things is really important because you, you oftentimes you can't have that conversation with somebody in your particular in your particular organization you know you may you know it may be sensitive enough or you know that you you don't really want to open yourself up to that so it's important to cultivate those people that you can do so he was one uh, we also had an opportunity when i was in the umass system they invested in executive coaches for all of the CEOs, not from a performance, there was no performance issues, but they felt like we weren't all working, we were, we were working great in our lanes and in our silos, but not necessarily working as well together as a team. They brought somebody in and I still call that individual to this day. Just, I'm thinking about this, you know, what do you think about this? And it's great to have that person to reach out to. Do you have that? Do you fill that role for other folks now? I do. There's a there's a couple people that that I continue to meet with. Certainly, when I was a secretary, you know, some individuals that that are there that are either still in state government or have transitioned from state government that I'll continue to meet with. My job every day is is mentoring the you know the the executives that report to me. So it's it's a part and parcel of of what. I feel like we have to do every day. The, the more I can grow the, you know, both the team that works for me and the leaders at the local level, the more I can focus on what is the next strategic step that we should be doing or where is the next area we should be going and not how they can handle an issue or a concern uh, locally for themselves. So I think, I think the mentoring thing is important and, and it's back to the leadership piece. I'd rather, I'd rather work with somebody and teach them or have them come along so that they can do it themselves, then, I mean, the easiest thing in the world is just to tell somebody what to do. But at the end of the day, that does, that's not scalable because, you know, there becomes too many decisions where you have to tell somebody what to do. You need them, and I want them to be able to think, you know, on, on his or her feet about, about the scenario that's in front of them. Think about what the solutions are. Think about what the potential pitfalls or what the traps are come up with a recommendation, happy to have the conversation about what I think might be the issue, but then let them succeed or to, in some extent, fail on something. You know, and I've done that before too. It's like, I don't think this is the right thing, but if you're, if you think it's right and you think you can deliver on it, I will support you. And then we may have a different conversation when it doesn't work out. <laughs> okay. I don't want to keep you any longer. So let me, let me just close on this. So what advice do you have to early careerists who aspire to lead in a healthcare organization, perhaps in a system like Stewart or somewhere else? I, I think my advice would be the, the people that I, I find who, who have success are the people that are willing to kind of jump in and roll their sleeves up and truly understand kind of what's going on in the organization. It's, it's too important a step to skip. If, if you were to come into an organization, you know, it's very difficult to come into an organization at a, at a level where you haven't done the hard work to really understand what it is. 
you gain credibility with the staff, you gain huge credibility, particularly on the healthcare side with the clinicians, where if you really understand, if you're talking about patient flow through the emergency department and you've really spent time either in the emergency department or working with the ED teams to understand what really happens when you have emergency service providers coming in, you have the walk-in patients, you have transfers from other facilities. If you're looking at it, you know, without that understanding, just looking at it as a number on a spreadsheet going like, wow, your, uh, your door to doc time is really bad. What are you going to do about it? Without kind of that background understanding of, well, what makes up that, that door to doc time and what are the other things to do that? I think it's just too important to skip. Everybody, I think people want to automatically kind of be in charge of something. I think the uh, people would be well served to, uh, to spend the time to understand it. It's one of the reasons why I thought coming into healthcare, being a consultant early on was great because I learned a lot about the inner workings of a hospital because we spent a lot of long nights kind of pulling through how the flow worked, what the numbers meant, where it came from, you know, how working with the individual staffs at the hospital, and it served me really quite well. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been great. I was so happy to be a part of it. Thanks.